Greetings from Bethel Memorial Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Brent, and it's a prayer meeting tonight, and we had a good time in the Word, and we had a great time in prayer. Again, praise items and prayer requests, and sharing. It's just a, just a great time to be together with brothers and sisters in the Lord. I've had some um, devotions recently that all seem to be on the same theme. I want to share a couple of verses tonight. Um, I don't know if you ever go see a counselor. I try to see one at least once a quarter. Uh, you could call him a mentor. You can call him a counselor. We talk about uh, ministry issues. We talk about uh, some of the counseling issues I'm involved with and, and uh, get advice. Um, and then I also talk about my personal stuff, the, 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 the struggles that I'm personally having. We all need to have that. Well, the verses that I want to look at tonight kind of uh, deal with seeking counsel, and I want to do that. But first, let me open in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word and how clear it is to us. And I pray that you would help us to, to know you and to hear your voice and receive your counsel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 32, <clears throat> verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Now, Psalm 32 has been linked with Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David's prayer after he was confronted about his sin with Bathsheba. And it was his, it was his confession in Psalm 51. Psalm 32 is more of a celebration of the forgiveness that God granted him. And in that granted uh, forgiveness, God says to David, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. So the first question I have with this is, who does God promise to counsel? One of the lies of the enemy would be, you've out God's love. God can no longer work in you. No. God promises to counsel even a sinner with all the grievous sins that David had, had, had done. He still made this promise. So he counsels anyone who will listen and receive it. What is instruction? I looked up some Hebrew words here. This idea of instruction is a, an attentiveness uh, give attention to, have insight and have understanding, not just about what is being taught, but about who you're teaching. I was asked by a professor when we were training, um, he said, do you teach lessons or do you teach people? And I would say the instruction here is focused on the people, to know the person that you're talking to. And then teaching is a Hebrew word meaning to throw or to shoot. Uh, to point out here, I think it's uh, like think about shooting a dart, uh, shooting an arrow. That it's the message that is going to go and pierce. But first, I'm going to, as an instructor, I'm going to think about who who it is I'm talking to, and as a teacher, I'm going to think about the message. So I instruct people. I teach lessons is the way I would kind of break that down. <clears throat> What's the goal of this instruction and teaching? That people would learn the way they should go. How many times do you seek guidance? I, I don't know what I should do here. What should I do? Well, God promises to instruct and teach us in the way we should go. And then that last phrase I really love, I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Counsel takes both those ideas of instruction and teaching. It's a, it's a closeness. If you've ever been to a counselor, they ask a lot of questions. Not that they're trying to test you. They're trying to get to know you. And then they can give you better counsel the more they understand who you are. Well, God knows us, and he says, I will counsel you, and I'm not taking my eye off of you. I will be watching you. One of the translations says, my loving eye. This is a, a closeness of God to say, I want to instruct and teach you so you know the way you should go. And not only do I need to know it, I need to have his strength to do it. The next verse, the next day was on 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I look at this and say, how can we best submit to God's counsel? By getting rid of the things that would hinder. What hinders our ability to hear God? Here it talks about destroying things. First of all, the word should destroy means to pull down, to pull down. If you ever watch YouTubes, you'll see people... Uh, call it watch so-and-so destroy somebody else in an argument i don't like that thought i i believe in destroying arguments but i don't want to destroy a person um so what hinders 
arguments. That Hebrew word is is a well thought out, um, uh, reasoned computation on how to win an argument. Like I've thought this through. These are really well organized thoughts. And then also the word opinion. That's just kind of haphazard. Well, that's how I feel. Well, we have to pull down all arguments and all opinions that are against the knowledge of God. And you'll see what what I mean against. They are lofty and they are raised. And if the word destroy means to pull down, these are all things that try to set themselves up higher than God. We need to pull those things down. And not just outside of us, the things inside of us that would have elevate ourselves, lift ourselves up higher than God. We have to humble ourselves. Someone came in tonight and said, why don't we pray on our knees more? We joked and said, we're all too old to get up after we pray on our knees. But we, the, the thought of kneeling before the Lord is a humble position. We need to pull down anything in us or anything around us. Um, someone came in tonight and also said, I watched the news and I got so upset. He said, well, don't spend too much time with the news. That Those are arguments and opinions that think that they're higher than God. We need to put God first. And the goal, then, is to take every thought captive. Um, where does the battle begin? In the mind. We need to remember it's in the mind. We don't just change our behaviors. We change the way we think. And we then as we think of things of God, we grow closer to him, and he enables us to change our behaviors. I think about this idea of taking every thought captive. That's such a beautiful thought. And I, I kind of it reminds me of the verse Romans 12, the first part of verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And I've looked at this verse recently. I remember saying, to conform to the world, we just need to do nothing. It's a passive activity. We're just going to go along. But we can be transformed by renewing our minds in the word of God, through the spirit of God, through prayer, through fellowship, all the things that would help us be transformed. And as I looked up that word transformed, it suggested transfigured. Could you imagine having been with the, with the three, Peter, James, and John, as Jesus was transfigured before them? We know that Moses spent time with God and his face would shine. My hope is that our hearts would shine as we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, by taking thoughts captive, by receiving the instruction and teaching and counsel of God and pulling down everything that would work against what God desires. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for these verses, and I pray that we would realize how important it is to just let you work in our hearts and our minds, and then, then we can see you change us, and we can reflect your glory better and better. Help us to live according to the way we should go, with your strength, and for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.